This is a video lecture for microbiology for Thursday, October 10th. We're starting on chapter eight on microbial metabolism. This will be a series of two video lectures, each lasting about 45 minutes. And so we start out with this chapter. Our objectives of this chapter are to understand the major microbial metabolic processes. So we're going to look at several different processes that are um, important in terms of energetics, and we will break down those processes. And we'll look at both anabolic processes as well as catabolic processes. You may have heard these terms before. Anabolic basically means to build up molecules and make larger molecules. Catabolic processes are to break down molecules in order to create energy. Then we'll look at the location of specific metabolic processes, and you have to be important. Um, you have to be uh, very clear here that we're dealing with both prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms, so we need to make the difference between those organisms because different metabolic processes occur in these different cell types, um, specifically in different locations. Okay, so when we define metabolism, this is basically all the chemical reactions and physical processes that occur in the cell. Anything that builds up molecules and makes larger molecules we call anabolism. Anything that breaks down molecules <coughs> excuse me, in structure we call metabolism. And so we have these different processes of metabolism. Anabolism builds up structures that are needed for the cell to exist and survive, and builds up macromolecules. Catabolism breaks down these macromolecules and allows the cell to generate energy. So if we look at our basic nutrient glucose, um, and this is the nutrient that it directly enters into glycolysis. If we break this down, then we can break this down by a catabolism. This will yield energy uh, as well as precursor molecules. So here we have precursors that the cell can use to build up macromolecules. We also have energy and electrons through ATP and through NADH. These precursors are built up into building blocks, such as amino acids, sugars, nucleotides, and fatty acids. Then they're built up to macromolecules. And once they're built up to macromolecules, then these are the components of a bacterial cell. Now, to understand these biochemical processes, we need to define enzymes. And enzymes are very important in both catabolic and anabolic processes because they allow these chemical reactions to occur. So enzymes specifically are proteins. Uh, with some exceptions, there are some enzymes that are made out of RNA, and they catalyze chemical reactions of life. So when you have a catalyst, since I introduced this term, catalysts are chemicals that increase the rate of reaction without becoming a part of the product or being consumed as a chemical reactant. So basically what they do is they increase the rate. So they speed up these chemical reactions so the cells can have the enzyme metabolites or enzyme products um, quickly enough to provide energy as well as providing building blocks for life. By speeding up the reactions, Enzymes are actually overcoming the energy of activation or the resistance force of a chemical, given chemical reaction. Enzymes provide alternative pathways that reduce the energy of activation for these reactions and thereby help them to occur at physiological temperature. Substrates are what we call reactants in biology. They're the molecules that enzymes act upon. And then products, same as chemistry, um, are what the enzymes produce. Okay, and here's a quick YouTube video of an enzyme reaction. Uh, just to get you oriented, this is an enzyme. It's called an endonuclease that will split DNA and split it up into smaller pieces. And so if I run this video, oops, 
Let me go back. Let's see if I can go back. Um, I'm not going to actually. I'm not going to run this right now. But if you want to watch this on YouTube, you can see this enzyme in action, actually chewing up this piece of DNA. Enzymatic reactions um, are very specific, and so you have an enzyme that has, and this is just a representation, an enzyme that has. Um, a configuration that only specific substrates can go into. Enzymes generally have another component called a coenzyme, which is not a protein, which is just another name for an enzyme helper. And once a coenzyme comes in, then that allows substrates to come in. The substrates then uh, form an enzyme substrate complex and then they're joined together to form a single product. Once the product is formed, the product drifts out of the enzyme as well as the coenzyme drifts out of the enzyme. Okay, so coenzyme is a very specialized term, but we need to back up and def define another term called cofactors. Cofactors are any type of enzyme helper. Cofactors, again, I'm going to mention this again, is it's very important they're any type of enzyme helper okay coenzymes are enzyme helpers that are organic as opposed to metallic cofactors which are inorganic okay so when we have cofactors there are two classes the first class is coenzymes which is organic and the second is a metallic cofactor which is inorganic now, when an enzyme contains its cofactors, then we call it a holoenzyme. Think whole. Don't think hollow. It looks like hollow to me, which is confusing, but think whole. An apoenzyme is an enzyme without its cofactors. And usually the enzyme, once it acquires its cofactors, is much more stable. So with this arrangement, um, there are what's, there's what is called the lock and key arrangement, which um, typically describes, it doesn't, it doesn't describe things as well as it could, but what this, what this arrangement infers is that only specific substrates will fit with specific enzymes. And so an enzyme that acts on glucose will not be the same enzyme that acts on something like sucrose because their configurations are different and enzymes are highly specific to their substrates. The bond formed between the enzyme and the substrates is loose and reversible. And so by having a loose and reversible bond, once that product is formed, it can drift away. So with an aid of a cofactor, not all enzymes have cofactors, but most of them do, the product is produced and then released. Some enzymes work inside the cell, and some enzymes work outside the cell. If they work outside, we use the term exoenzyme. If they work inside, we use the term endoenzyme. If an enzyme is on all the time, and is present and prevalent all the time, even if you add more substrate, we call it constitutive. That's a really tiny writing, I do apologize. But constitutive enzyme is on all the time and is well in, uh, available in relative abundance at all times. Regulated enzymes, you will have a few enzymes if there is not much substrate, but if you add more substrate, then the, the enzymes will also produce at a high level so you're able to metabolize the substrate. If you remove the substrate, once the substrate's gone, then the enzyme is repressed. And so the amount of enzyme that the cell has will be lower. So it can regulate based on the amount of substrate. More substrate means more enzyme. Less substrate means the enzyme is repressed and you have less enzyme. Uh, different types of reactions. On the left side, you have a synthesis reaction. So we have two molecules of sugar, okay? Uh, this just happens to be molecules of glucose. They come into close proximity, and with the addition of ATP, then the um, 
glucosidic bond is created, you lose a water, okay? And then you get what's called a glucosidic bond. And then this produces what's called maltose. You can call this glucosidic or glycosidic, either one works just fine, okay? Now, so because this is a synthesis reaction and it produces water, sometimes synthesis reactions are called condensation. In hydrolysis, we actually add water. This is two amino acids that form a small peptide. And when we add water, that will break down the peptide bond and create a carboxyl group and a separate amino group. And so this hydrolysis reaction is actually a lysis. It's breaking apart the molecule into its component amino acids. It involves the addition of water, so we call it hydrolysis. There are a lot of enzymes that we will uh, study that are involved in disease states. So this is sort of the flip side of metabolism. Um, and when these enzymes cause disease to be worse, then we talk, call them virulence factors, or sometimes we'll call them toxins. Streptococcus pyogenes, which is a causative agent in strep throat. It's not the only causative agent, but it is one produces an enzyme called streptokinase, which will dissolve blood clots, and that allows the bacteria to get into wounds and actually become systemic and get into the bloodstream. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this is an enzyme or a bacterial species that we've worked with in the laboratory, actually can break down skin. It can go through skin and it does it by producing enzymes elastase and collagenase which will digest elastin and collagen in connective tissue. In that way, it can dissolve skin and it can break down and create um, an environment where the disease can spread. Clostridium perfringens, which causes gas gangrene, um, produces lipase. Lipase sounds like lipid. It breaks down the phospholipid bilayer and it can damage cell membranes and by damaging cell membranes, and it will cause tissue death. And so um, these are all very, very um, uh, tragic virulence factors when they're involved in disease. But some of these have been utilized pharmaceutically because the enzymes may have some type of therapeutic benefit outside of the context of an infectious disease. Okay. Um, this is uh, a wound that's caused by MRSA, and you see these nice margins here where the, um, where the flesh has been cut away. This is not the, how the bacteria works. The bacteria would be much dirtier and um, create much more of a problem. But it, in the case of this particular individual, what they had to do is they had to cleanse the wound and actually debride the wound, which means to cut away the infected portions, and then they'll put a graft on top of that. Now, I do want to um, also mention that you're not gonna see somebody in the hospital walking around like this. Uh, this wound is being dressed, so it's in the process of having a dressing, and um, by, by showing this, it's not, you know, not normally shown. It would be covered with a sterile dressing in order to prevent disease spread. Okay, enzymes are kind of wimps. I have to say this um, delicately, but enzymes have a very, very fragile structure, and so they're very sensitive to their environment. They're suited for the environment that the organism has adapted to live in. But if you take enzymes out of that environment, then they tend to fall apart. So they exist at a very specific range of temperature, pH, and osmotic pressure. The chemical term for a sensitive or a wimpy enzyme is called labile. A labile enzyme is chemically unstable. It's the opposite of stable. And in the denaturation process, when a enzyme denatures, that means that it loses function. And the weak bonds of an apoenzyme, this is an enzyme without its cofactors, are broken. And the enzyme stretches out, and that renders the enzyme non-functional. Now, when we step back from this, 
you'll see that there's a whole host of enzymes that are um, functioning in cell biology. And when we put all those enzymatic reactions together, then we get metabolic pathways. Okay, here's a typical cellular pathway. This is just one um, example of um, pathways that are shown in different colors. This is not the entirety of cell metabolism, but this just shows the major energetics that are happening within the cell. Now, to make this more simple, we'll break it down into smaller pathways that might be linear. You might have a cyclical pathway and you might have a branch pathway. When a branch pathway splits one molecule into two, we call it divergence. And when it takes two molecules and combines them into one, then we call it convergence. Going back to enzymes and how they work, enzymes can be inhibited in different processes. And, and usually this type of inhibition is done by the cell itself in order to shut down enzymes when they're no longer needed. So when you have a normal substrate, the normal substrate, substrate fits in the enzyme, but you can also have a competitive inhibitor. Competitive inhibitor has generally the same shape as the normal substrate, and so they can both fit into the enzyme's active site. If the normal substrate fits in, then the reaction proceeds. But if the competitive inhibitor fits in, then the reaction is blocked. And usually these are irreversibly bound. So this competitive inhibitor drifts in and out, but its overall effect is to lower the rate of enzymatic reaction. And also have a non-competitive inhibitor and where the substrate is specific to the active site but you also have an inhibitor that's specific to a regulatory site. And what happens here is if the substrate um, moves in without inhibition, then the reaction proceeds and it forms some type of product. Now this product is actually the inhibitor here. And if the product um, is available in relative abundance because this reaction is preceded like it's supposed to, uh, or to proceed, then you'll get an accumulation of products, so that product is no longer needed. And then that product fits into this regulatory site. When the product fits into the regulatory site, that abolishes the active site so it gets smaller and the substrate can no longer fit. This is called feedback inhibition. And in that way, once enough product is formed, then the enzymes can shut down and uh, can be further regulated. So these enzymes are no longer needed, so they're shut down by the regulation of the product. Regulation can also happen at a genetic level. Let's say you have a protein that has been, been produced from DNA going to messenger RNA to protein protein is folded into its correct three-dimensional structure as an enzyme, and then it interacts with the substrate to form product down here. And the product itself could interact with the genetics and shut off the production of the enzyme. So in this way, the cell is, once the product is formed, the cell no longer needs the enzyme. So it shuts it down from a genetic level, so the enzyme itself is never created. So when this happens, we call this enzymatic repression. And so that stops further synthesis. Um, so the enzyme is no longer produced. We can also have enzymatic induction. And this initiates enzyme production in the presence of substrate. So the opposite thing happens. If you have a lot of substrate that needs to be produced or converted to product, then the enzyme will interact with the DNA and cause the DNA to produce the enzyme rather than shutting down the process. Okay, so let's review. So first of all, what is metabolism? If you go back a few slides, we um, determined that metabolism was all the different chemical reactions within the cell. The difference between anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is a term for chemical reactions that build up larger molecules, uh, such as macromolecules that are involved in life. 
in catabolism is when these molecules are broken down, and the purpose of catabolism primarily is to produce energy. What are the substrate and the product? The substrate is just the chemical or chemicals that are participating in the chemical reaction. And when they're converted by that chemical reaction, then they're converted to product. And how is a holoenzyme different than an apoenzyme? A holoenzyme, remember, is whole, so it includes all of its cofactors. And an apoenzyme is not whole, it uh, has no, none of its cofactors. And so the holoenzyme with its cofactors is much more stable than the apoenzyme. What's the difference between competitive and non-competitive inhibition? Competitive inhibition occurs when the inhibitor and the substrate are competing for the same active site on the enzyme. And in non-competitive inhibition, there's an additional regulatory site. And when an inhibitor interacts with the regulatory site, that prevents the substrate from binding the active site. Uh, there's a really good slide uh, that shows some really good uh, figures on that. And so make sure that you review competitive and non-competitive inhibition. In terms of energy, um, and uh, forgive me, in biology, we have a completely different nomenclature for energetics as compared to chemistry. Uh, this always bugs me because I teach both classes, and so I have to adjust my nomenclature. When a reaction produces energy, we call it exergonic, and that is usually energy to produce ATP. And an exergonic reaction is similar to what we call exothermic in chemistry. When a reaction requires energy, we call it endergonic. That means that the reaction needs ATP or needs some other energy source in order to uh, occur. So endergonic, that would be like endothermic reactions in chemistry. So cells are actually taking apart nutrients, they're breaking down nutrients, and they extract chemical energy already present in nutrients. Cells are not converting heat directly, but they're actually breaking down nutrition so they get small bursts of energy and store them through ATP. We also talk about redox reactions, which include oxidation and reduction. Um, oxidation um, and reduction, when we talk about redox, simply involve the exchange of an electron. There's always an electron donor, which is going to give up its electron, and there's an electron acceptor, and they make what's called a redox pair. And you can look at simple things, even like respiration, and you can identify in respiration what's the electron donor and what's the electron acceptor. So if we start out with an electron donor, all it does across the reaction is just shuttle that electron to its acceptor. And a, a resulting reaction occurs. It's not just the electron that's transferred, but you also usually see the transfer of a hydrogen at the same time. So the electron donor, when it before it uh, gives up its electron, we refer to it as reduced. The acceptor is oxidized. However, once the electron donor gives up its electron, now it's oxidized and the electron acceptor has been reduced. So energy that is captured by the electron acceptor can be used to phosphorylate ADP. ADP is adenosine diphosphate. It gets an additional phosphate, and then it becomes adenosine triphosphate, which is used energetically. Adenosine triphosphate is formed, and it has a very high energy phosphate bond, and that allows the energy to be stored. When the electron is transferred from the 
donor to the acceptor, then that allows the ability to capture ATP. At the same time that the electron is transferred, then we also see hydrogen being transferred. Hydrogen, when it's H plus, is just a proton. And we can see that transfer is also involved in the electron transfer process. Now, this is important because when we write down chemical equations, we don't track electrons. We won't see the electron being transferred. But we will see hydrogen going from the side of the electron donor to the electron acceptor. And that's a key feature that we can follow. Once we see that hydrogen being transferred, then we realize that a redox reaction has occurred. Okay, so we look at our molecule of glucose here. It's a high energy molecule. It's very, very energetic. And if you look at the overall reaction of the respiration down here at the bottom, we have glucose and oxygen. This is aerobic respiration. And then it's converted to carbon dioxide in water. We have to be careful here because other organisms, other bacteria and archaea do not breathe oxygen, so there are other types of respiration, so we need to term this aerobic respiration. Okay, so oxygen is added to glucose, and glucose is then broken down, and it's at a higher energy molecule, and as it's broken down, then it's energy of every breakdown step uh, transfers hydrogen ions and electrons and these hydrogen ions and electrons are highly energetic and the energy and electrons are then captured as ATP okay ATP is then used to form cellular work perform cellular work and then carbon di or excuse me glucose is then metabolized it's actually oxidized to its final oxidation product, which is carbon dioxide. And then protons are left with electrons. These combine with oxygen, which is our terminal electron acceptor, and then we get water. So we can follow the redox reaction here because we have glucose that has hydrogen in it. I didn't show the formula of glucose, but it's C6H12O6. So we have hydrogen here plus oxygen. Glucose is oxidized to carbon dioxide and then oxygen is reduced and we see the hydrogen move to oxygen to form water. Also in this process we need to shuttle electrons so we need an electron carrier. The electron carrier not only can take carriers electrons but it also carries um, hydrogen. Okay so we start out with NAD which is actually it should be NAD plus this interacts with electrons and hydrogen and it forms NADH and a proton, okay? So you start out with oxidized nicotinamide, you add two electrons, two hydrogens, and you get reduced nicotinamide. And this is a part of the NADH molecule. Okay, NADH then shuttles electrons to what's called the electron transport chain where ATP is formed. There are other compounds that are involved in electron transfer. NAD and FAD, NAD and FAD, are used in glycolysis. And NADP, which is nicotinamide adenine, adenine dinucleotide phosphate, NADP is involved in photosynthesis. Now, ATP is a very special molecule. It's adenosine triphosphate. So we have three groups here. We have an adenine group, which is a nitrogenous base. We have ribose, which is a five-membered sugar. And then we have three phosphate groups, okay? Both of these phosphate groups are, re are highly reactive, but the most energy is in the final phosphate bond here. Okay, so if we can break off this phosphate, then ATP is converted to ADP, and we'll get a burst of energy. ATP is always being utilized 
to catalyze chemical reactions, or to, excuse me, to provide energy for chemical reactions. And when it's utilized, it has to be replenished as an ongoing cycle in the cell. This is very, very important because the ATP is distributed throughout the cell in order to uh, uh, function uh, to enable metabolism. ATP hydrolysis, that's the reaction where ATP is, re, uh, is uh, broken down to ADP, powers biosynthesis reactions, and it also prepares molecules like glucose for catabolism. And here's the major reaction. ATP is broken down to ADP. You have a free phosphate group, and then that releases a significant amount of energy. So now we're going to talk about the different pathways. And this type of biochemistry always gives students fits, but I'm going to try to break this down so you have a distinct understanding of these pathways and also a distinct understanding of what you're going to be required to know for the exam. So catabolic pathways. The primary catabolic pathway to break down yummy glucose is glycolysis. And this is the most common cellular pathway. Okay, glucose is converted to a three carbon product called pyruvate as a process of glycolysis. Okay, so if we look at the overall process, it's a multi step process, but you put in glucose and then you get pyruvate, which is also called pyruvic acid, out of the process. After glycolysis, you have what's called the Krebs cycle which is also called the tricarboxylic acid pathway or the TCA pathway. This converts a substrate called acetyl-CoA to ATP, carbon dioxide, and electron carriers, FADH2 and NADH. Then finally, in catabolism, you have the electron transport chain where the electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, will deliver their electrons to the final electron acceptor, which in aerobic metabolism is oxygen, and in anaerobic metabolism can be other electron acceptors. So all the three of these processes together, the glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain, occur um, to facilitate respiration, whether it be aerobic or anaerobic. Okay, so with the um, ability for organisms to breathe things other than oxygen, then we need to account for anaerobic metabolism. Okay, and if we just break down uh, aerobic and anaerobic respiration, as well as a process called fermentation in the complete absence of an electron acceptor, then glycolysis basically functions the same. So we look at all three of these glycolysis boxes. You start out with one glucose, you get two pyruvates. Glucose has six carbons, pyruvate has three carbons. They produce ATP and NADH. Okay. Then you go through what's called the preparatory reaction where pyruvate, which has three carbons, gives up carbon dioxide and forms acetyl-CoA, which has two carbons. Okay, and that happens in aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Then you have the Krebs cycle, which produces more carbon dioxide, produces ATP itself, and then electron carriers FAD, H2, and NADH. Okay, those go to the electron transport chain, where in aerobic respiration, oxygen is the final electron acceptor, in anaerobic respiration, you have other electron acceptors, including sulfate, nitrate, and carbonate. Okay, and that's where the majority of ATP is formed. Okay. For aerobic respiration, you get 38 ATPs produced net. For anaerobic respiration, it's anywhere between 2 to 36, depending on what the electron acceptor is. And now we go over to the special case of fermentation. When there is no terminal electron acceptor, then you get a partial fermentation or a partial conversion of glucose. 
and this partial conversion of glucose once uh, pyruvate is formed and goes to acetyl-CoA can either produce lactic acid, which we call an acidic fermentation, or ethanol, which we call an alcoholic fermentation. Okay, there are other alcohols, acids, and gases that can be formed during fermentation, but the basic framework is that it's either acidic or alcoholic. Okay, so fermentation is just the incomplete oxidation of glucose. I'm going to say that again. Fermentation is just the incomplete oxidation of glucose. And it's very energetically unfavorable. It only produces two ATPs. So if we break down these different processes, we can start out with glycolysis. That's just the conversion of one glucose molecule to two pyruvic acid molecules. We can also call that pyruvate. We're doing, going from a six carbon chain to two three carbon chains. It does create NADH. NADH, um, once it's converted from a NAD plus, contains electrons and hydrogen. And you get the net gain of two ATPs. I say net gain because it actually, you get four ATPs, but it actually takes two of those to prime this process. So the net gain is only two. Pyruvic acid is sort of a nifty metabolite. It can go a multiplicity of directions. It is uh, the breakdown product of glycolysis here. And normally for energetics, it will just go through the process of respiration. However, it can ferment. And we like this fermentation industrially because we can get all sorts of different types of products like vinegar or propionic acid or alcohol or acetone or other types of um, uh, alcohol byproducts. Or it can go into anabolic processes and it can create amino acids, it cre can create different sugars, and it can also create lipids. Okay, so we call pyruvic acid a central metabolite. And as a central metabolite, then it can go a variety of directions. In this context, we're talking about respiration, so it will go into acetyl CoA. Now, I do want to point out. However, that we have a step here, Pyruv pyruvic acid doesn't directly go into the Krebs cycle. Pyruvic acid has to be converted into acetyl-CoA, and we call that the preparatory reaction. When it is converted into acetyl-CoA, it also breathes off carbon dioxide. So you see a carbon dioxide that will be an offshoot here that's not shown on this slide. Uh, pyruvic acid has three carbons, acetyl-CoA has two carbons, and so the carbon dioxide, the third carbon, is breathed off. Okay? And that has to happen. So we call that the preparatory reaction. Write that down. Preparatory reaction is just the conversion of pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA and CO2. Then we get to the Krebs cycle. So we've um, formed acetyl-CoA by the preparatory reaction. It joins with a four-carbon substrate called oxaloacetic acid, and it participates in seven chemical transformation, which forms a cycle. All reactions occur twice for a single glucose molecule. Okay, so the Krebs cycle it starts based on acetyl-CoA, and there are two acetyl-CoA molecules for every molecule of glucose, causes the cycle to turn twice. This generates two more ATP molecules, and it spins off more electrons, so we get carriers NADH and FADH2, okay? And then NADH and FADH2 go to the electron transport chain. Okay, so we have these oxidized carriers that receive electrons from reduced carriers. This is where the majority of ATP is formed for aerobic respiration. For every molecule of glucose, you get 34 molecules of ATP. And the final step of the electron transport chain is the acceptance of electrons and hydrogen by oxygen, okay, so the electrons and hydrogen 
go to reduce oxygen, and that forms water. ATP synthesis itself is driven by hydrogen ions that are pumped through the inner membrane of the cell or the inner membrane of the mitochondria, depending on whether it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic. And then this pump actually drives, like a hydroelectric pump, drives the synthesis of ATP. Each NADH molecule that enters the chain produces three ATPs. Each FAD, oh, I should point this out. This is not on a bullet. Each FAD H2 molecule that enters the chain produces two ATPs. So write that down. And the conversion of NADH and FAD H2 electrons to ATP is termed oxidative phosphorylation. So this whole process of the electron transport chain is also called oxidative phosphorylation. ADP is getting a phosphate, so it's being phosphorylated, and the electron carriers, NADH2, NADH and FADH2, are being oxidized, so that's called oxidative. Okay, and here's the electron transport chain, and I'm not, I'm not really concerned that you know these different components. But some of these components act as pumps, so they pump hydrogens from the inner membrane to the outer membrane. Okay, and you get a buildup of hydrogen. These are just protons in the outer membrane. Okay, and then this buildup naturally goes through what's called ATP synthase, which is the enzyme complex that forms ATP. So this natural gradient, this gradient of hydrogen, which builds up on the outer membrane and then flows naturally to the inner membrane, allows for ATP synthesis. Each one of these pumps is fueled by electrons that are being transported by NADH and FADH2. Okay, FADH2 is not shown on this slide, which is totally unacceptable, but it is also metabolized. Okay, the process where that hydrogen flows through ATP synthase we call chemiosmosis. Okay, to build up to chemiosmosis, the electron transport carrier shuttle electrons. That provides energy for the electron transport chain. The electron transport carriers, when they have energy, they pump the protons, or H+, into the outer con compartment of the mitochondrion or the periplasm in prokaryotic cells. Hydrogen ion and proton are the same thing. So when I say proton, just think H+. And this sets up what's called a proton motive force. The protons achieve a higher concentration outside of the membrane than inside of the membrane and that force then creates a gradient which is the difference in charge in between the outer membrane compartment and the inner membrane compartment. The outer membrane compartment is going to have a positive charge, the inner membrane compartment is going to have a net negative charge because of the, of the lack of hydrogen. So this is a lot like the positive and negative poles of a battery. So the hydrogen plus is going to move towards the more negative side, so it's going to move through ATP synthase. And ATP synthase, it's called a proton pump, but that's just not a good term for it. It's just really a tube where the protons just naturally flow like a hydroelectric dam, like the turbine in a hydroelectric dam. The water naturally flows. That turns the turbine, and that's how you get electricity. With ATP synthase, the protons naturally flow. That turns the bottom of the ATP synthase uh, protein complex, and that facilitates the production of ATP. So don't call it pump. Call it a turbine or call it a tube. Pump, um, that's the word from the book. I don't like it. It doesn't function as a pump. The other uh, protein complexes in the complex do function as pumps, 
but this is more of a turban. Okay, the same process occurs in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Only in eukaryotes, the electron transport chain is in the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria. In prokaryotes, the electron transport chain are embedded in the cell membrane or the inner membrane of the cell. Okay, remember, prokaryotes don't have mitochondria, but they do have membranes where the electron transport chain can occur. Okay, and I'm going to let you look at this on your own. This just shows how ATP synthase works. Uh, it shows the flow of hydrogen through the tube and how it allows ADP to be converted to ATP. So when we look at aerobic respiration, this is when we start out with glucose and oxygen. Our total possible yield of ATP is 40. Okay, so we have 40 ATP molecules that come out of them. Okay, four ATPs occur directly from glycolysis, two from the Krebs cycle, 34 from the electron transport chain, and then, but it takes two ATPs to prime the pump for glycolysis, to prime the reaction. So when we take away those two, then the maximum net yield is 38 ATPs from one molecule of glucose. Glucose is then converted, it's oxidized to CO2, and oxygen is then converted to water. It's reduced to water in the process. Oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. Okay, it is aerobic. And so the glu glucose we refer to as the electron donor, and oxygen we refer to as the electron acceptor. Okay, I've gone a little over time, so I'm going to conclude this video lecture one, and then we'll start up with video lecture two next.